I now give the floor to Mr. Method Gundiza, Program Coordinator with Earthlore Foundation from Zimbabwe. His talk is entitled, Reweaving the Basket of Life, Restoring the Earth Jurisprudence Practices of Reciprocity, a case study from Bikita, Zimbabwe. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Most indigenous peoples have good stories of origin. And in these stories of origin, they describe in mythical ways how they came to be in the territories where they are. We find that in most of these stories, including the story of creation, they show how human beings actually arrived as latecomers to a system that already was a system that already had an abundance of life on it with rhythms, cycles, patterns, and systems that already supported life. When human beings arrived and entered into that system, the sun and the moon, for example, did not stop rising nor setting. The air, the water and the earth all didn't stop moving. Neither did the plants and animals and everything else and everybody else that humans found already there. Such is the order which we human beings found, the order into which future generations would be born into an order that is itself a manifestation of a very intricate system working behind the scenes to support life, including human beings. And we also find that human beings actually become truly human when they find their rightful space and place in this vast ancient earth and cosmic system which has actually inspired complex yet similar ways to acknowledge life through different belief systems. I will share with you a story about Bikita, Zimbabwe, and I do participate in that story. It is a story of revival and transformation. I am one of the first graduates of a three-year training course in Earth Jurisprudence, which was developed by the Gaia Foundation. And through going, undergoing this course, I was inspired to go back to my roots in Bikita, because I'm currently living in South Africa. With the support of my organization, Earth Law Foundation, and in collaboration with other organizations, especially the Gaia Foundation, the African Biodiversity Network, the Seed and Knowledge Initiative, and the African Earth Jurisprudence Network. I have been able to go back to my roots, and this is the story I'm telling you. I was born and brought up in Bikita, southeast of Zimbabwe, which is a very hilly area with rivers and streams, very undulating topography. And when I grew there, the mountains were all lush, the forests with perennial rivers full of deep pools along the courses. Wetlands and springs were all common sight and the elders actually grew wetland crops like brown rice, a local chuba called madumbe and another one called tsenza. And farmers used to grow and harvest in such a way they could actually stop farming the following season and rest the land, as they say in the local language. But today, most of the rivers don't flow anymore all year round, except when we have very good rains. 
excessive overgrazing and cutting of trees leading to erosion has actually choked all the streams and the rivers and the mountains feel very barren now. Wild animals have also deserted the area. You could spot a hyena, you know, at dusk if you were lucky. But when I started going back to my roots in Bikita, learning from the Amazonians, I started to engage elders in the community, speaking to them one by one so they could share of how things used to be when they followed their traditions and their customary laws and governance systems to hold and to participate and to belong to their land. These dialogues with the elders eventually gave way to community-wide di dialogues in which <clears throat> all other community members participated. And it was through these community dialogues that the community began to recognize again the laws, but also the wisdom of the traditional knowledge of the elders. And this is when they began to recover their capacity and their role to find solutions to what was happening in their community. In Bikita, millet, an African crop that most of you probably know, had been grown for centuries. And it was the staple to most households. But in the turn of the 80s into the 90s, most families actually abandoned this, uh, this seed. But as we dialogued more and more with the elders, we actually found that the loss of that seed was in itself a reflection of the loss of the connection between the community itself, but also with the environment. As it emerged, the seed of millet was really at the center of the social fabric of the community. It was one that kept the, the community together. Indeed, it is very labor intensive, but this also meant that um, a single family wouldn't process it on its own. It needed to count on the support of the rest of the, the community. And so because of that, the community would talk about a local uh, term called jangano, which describes an arrangement where the community comes together to work together. This could be on different things like millet, winnowing, threshing, win, uh, you know, harvesting, and all sorts of activities. And it was through this particular activity called jangano where the widows, the elderly, and the orphans would be protected. They would actually participate in the safety net of the community. And as it turned out, this had also been lost when the seed of millet was lost in the community. So we began to engage the community more and more into what could be done and as it emerged, firstly, two chiefs from two communities, one called Chirorwe and another one called Mamutse, who had been participating in the dialogues, actually took the resolve to revive their traditional um, rituals, one to ask for the rain and one for thanksgiving which is also known as first fruits. And as that was happening, we also saw that through the community dialogues, the return of millet began to happen gradually, gradually. For example, in 2016, 2015, 2016, which was a very bad year in Southern Africa in terms of rain, those few farmers that had actually revived millet found that they harvested something when the rest of the community members actually got nothing. 
An angle of mine actually harvested 30 by 50 kg bags of millet in such a bad year. And he made a decision that he would actually um, stop farming the following year just so he could rest his land. So it was the revival of millet, it was the revival of uh, rituals by the traditional leadership. And in this revival of rituals, the community actually contributed materials that were needed. And they do participated in some of the rituals that they could. But one thing that worried the community as they started reviving the rituals was that the physical state of the sacred natural sites, I'm talking here of the mountains, the springs, and the forests where these rituals take place, the physical condition was bad. They were degraded. So as they revived the ritual, they found that they needed to do more to actually protect the sacred sites, to revive them to the stage where they used to be, as natural as they used to be. And as this was also happening, we found that other community members became more confident to bring up certain seeds that had also been abandoned. And an example here is one locally named as the Soboda, which is in the grass family I can't describe to you very well. And this had been, uh, this had remained with only one uh, woman in the community. And through the community dialogues, this was revived and shared and once again multiplied by the community. And when Soboda and Millet got multiplied in the communities, we began to, saw, to see various structures also coming up to support that. And we began to see also how the basket weavers started to remember how to weave their baskets. We began to see how, um, you know, the potters remembered how to make clay pots. And as they were doing that, the community began to remember again. Where was it that we got the reeds to weave the baskets? Where was it that we got the sticks to thresh the millet? And as they remembered all this, they remembered all the various and important elements and important biodiversity spots within the territories that had supported life for all this time and a process to revive and to protect these spaces actually started. And as that was happening, we began to observe also that there were certain bird species. The long-tailed red and black birds began to arrive. There were certain grasshopper species, locally named in the names of uh, Guaramascati, Bori Mori, these had been last seen so many years and they began to arrive into the territory. It was in this hive of activity, people, birds, insects, animals, and the revival of wetlands, of forests, protecting the mountains again, the basket of life is beginning to be rewoven again as all these life elements find their rightful place in the community and they revive the lost affair between humans and nature for the greater good. As we listen more and more to the elders, we see how they understand the connectedness in the web of life. For example, they do not see farming as an end in itself. For them, farming requires a holistic understanding of the ecosystem, the climate, the constellations, the moon cycles, 
even a deep capacity to read the whole interrelated system, it's not about maximizing our capacity to draw food from the earth. They show how they understand that it is about participating with humility in the dance of life, working in harmony with nature, and sharing space with other species that are part of this web of life. My colleagues from Uganda, Ethiopia, Benin, and Kenya will tell stories that are probably similar to the one I'm telling today. As a colleague has shared earlier on, through our work, the African Commission passed a resolution 372 last year on the recognition of sacred natural sites and the customary governance systems that are applicable there. And this has created a legal framework for us to work with communities to really uh, revive the natural environment. We think this is, our, this is the work of our time. As our ancestors before us, we need to challenge ourselves to pass on to the future generations a planet that is vibrant with life. Thank you. I thank <clears throat> Method Gundiza for that very inspiring story of, of how communities really across Africa rediscovered their, are rediscovering their connections to nature and in so doing, reviving their communities and sustainable con um, consumption and production systems uh, and in the process improving the level of well-being by focusing on sufficiency rather than accumulation. Very inspiring. Uh, 